My name's Simeon Quarry. I'm a Canon ambassador and I'm a filmmaker and also a photographer. And in these recent times, many of us have been challenged to do more with less. Essentially, can we work with smaller crews, less equipment, and at the same time maintain our production value and quality? I had the opportunity of shooting with both the R5 and the C70 on exactly the same shoot. And I knew going into it that the space would be very tight. Because these cameras are using the RF mount, the RF lenses, the connection is able to process much more data much more quickly. And as a result, the autofocus is much quicker and the stabilization um, is much more effective. So with both cameras, I was able to shoot in the most precarious positions and still walk away with the shot that I wanted without tripods, without monopods. And that was extremely liberating. How many times do you end up being on a location and someone says to you that they want to you know, record a quick interview or record a vox pop? It's the first interview where I'm hand-holding the camera and having a rock steady shot. Like textiles and wallpapers. In many shoots the sound is an element that is absolutely critical and I've got professional microphones of XLR and being able to take the C70 as a dedicated cinema camera and plug in my microphones was, was fantastic. Because of the digital stabilization built into the C70, I'm able to capture the interview totally handheld. Because the camera was so lightweight, the weight wasn't a factor that was tying me out. I was able to do an interview in a way that I had never done an interview before. One of the tools of storytelling that I love to use is depth of field. I love to be able to get the viewer and the audience to focus on the part of the frame that's most important to the story. The full frame sensor on the R5 enables me very easily to get that amazing depth of field. Combined with an RF lens that's shooting 1.2, combine that with autofocus, creates an aesthetic that is associated with high production values. Good at tracking and enlarging with her body shape as she gets closer. That is nuts. I'm now gonna keep on the trousers, see what happens. I'm locked on. Amazing. <laughs> the hardest thing about that shot is gonna be getting up after doing it. <laughs> I'm gonna select the pencil tip, press record and go for it. And it's actually tracking the pencil as it's drawing. And this is macro. Do you see that? <laughs> when you're shooting with 8K resolution, the importance of having the subject in focus is absolutely critical. With the C70, the ND filters built into the camera, those virtual sunglasses, as it were, allow me to add up to 10 stops of ND and then open up the aperture on a 1.2 lens. Combine that with autofocus, combine that with professional audio going into the camera to create storytelling components that really push me as a creative uh, and as a storyteller. And, and that for me is really exciting. For the R5, we have C-Log, and that allows us just to adjust the highlights in the shadows so that we can get the image that we're looking for. But the C70 is a full-on cinema camera where we get C-Log 3 in addition and also C-Log 2. And that C-Log 2 is 16 stops of dynamic range. I felt that it was a format that was really designed for a professional grader, right? a professional colorist, which I'm not. But thanks to the DGO sensor, C-Log 2 has become more accessible. For example, when I was shooting with Bryony, we had certain situations where we were shooting on the inside of her studio, but I was able to see on the outside. Thanks to the DGO sensor, I've kind of got that flexibility to bring back the color tones that I want, and also those shadows and those highlights. I really enjoyed using both cameras. The, the R5 is a full frame professional photography camera that allows me, as someone who shoots both photo and video, to also shoot best in class of video with 8K moving image. The C70 is a Super 35 cinematic camera. It's the first time that Canon have included an RF mount within a cinema camera so that we can now pair RF lenses with a cinema body. And that takes advantage of the speed of connection for autofocus and also for the image stabilization, whilst kind of pairing it with the higher supreme optics that you get within RF lenses. But combine that also with the fact that that camera has got professional audio coming in and also 16 stops of dynamic range. 
it means that between these two cameras, I've actually got the tool or tools that I need to be able to respond to these new market conditions, which essentially challenge me to increase the quality of my productions whilst decreasing the footprint and also doing more but with less equipment. And these are capabilities of the camera that change the way you work. Hello and welcome to the penultimate Canon Vision Q&A, which forms part of a special series of sessions with a bunch of all knowledgeable DAPs and experts um, who will be talking in depth about their experiences in the industry and the exciting new launches that happened yesterday, all of which is of course part of Canon Vision. Now, as you are all aware by now, this virtual trade show has been created in place of this year's IBC. And even though it would have been so good to do all of this in person with actual people and actual networking, it's really nice to be back with another virtual showcase following Canon's biggest launch to date back in July with the EOS R5 and R6. Now, some of you are probably familiar with my face by now. I have tuned into the sessions yesterday and um, earlier on today. But for those of you who don't know me, let me just introduce myself. My name is Lucy Hedges. I'm the technology editor for the Metro newspaper in the UK. I'm also a presenter for the BBC Travel Show and just all round tech enthusiast. So I'm really happy and excited to be here and chairing these sessions. Um, now, as most of you know, yesterday saw the launch of some pretty exciting and inspiring new products for the industry to sink, sink their teeth into, whether it's cinematographers, independent filmmakers, any, anyone in broadcasting. So let's just do a quick recap of exactly what's been launched. So first up, we've got the EOS C70, a new compact cinema camera, and the first with an RF mount bridging Canon cinema EOS and EOS R systems. It's also the most compact and lightweight cinema EOS camera to date. You know, it is packed to the hilt with exciting features and all the ingredients to make one of the best cinema cameras around. Thanks to features like high frame rate 4K shooting at 120 frames per second with audio recording, dual pixel autofocus and with intelligent tracking, a touch interface, a new ND filter system providing up to 10 stops, 13 customizable buttons and dual SD card slots, all baked into a very distinctive and compact design. So ultimately, you know, it's Canon's vision involves taking 35 movie making into an exciting new direction with a camera that ultimately wants to transform the way films and video are made and to transform the way that people work you know, in order to meet the diverse and evolving recording requirements of the industry. Um, then there's the newly announced mount adapter EF EOS R 0.71 times, giving users access to an extensive range of Canon EF mount lenses while allowing for even more creative freedom. And finally, demonstrating Canon's commitment to lens innovation, there's the CJ20 EX5B. It's a high performance broadcast lens that's been designed, uh, it's been engineered even, to resolve an outstanding level of detail across an equally outstanding zoom range. So that's the products. Um, so what can you expect from this Q&A session? Okay, so Canon's invited a selection of guest speakers and, you know, a brilliant bunch of inspirational and all knowledgeable individuals to talk to us about their experiences in the industry, about their projects and shoots they've been involved in, and of course, all the Canon kit they've used to achieve this. Um, so basically, this is a real fun opportunity for you guys to be inspired by fellow filmmakers and, you know, get a real in-depth insight into the way these products work. Um, it's worth noting the sessions will be available to replay later on the Canon Vision platform in case you miss one, or you just want to replay over and over again. And of course, social media is incredibly important to so make sure you keep an eye out on the Canon Pro social media channels to take a look at more content shot with the newly launched products. And of course, loads of cool other content. All you've got to do is head over to Canon EMEA Pro on Facebook and Twitter and do your thing. You know what to do. Um, so before we get going, I just want to give you a bit of an overview of what this session is all about, just to whet your appetite a little bit. So joining me is director, cinematographer, photographer, and VR expert, Simeon Quarry. You've just seen him in the video, and he's going to be talking about his use of the EOS C70 and how technology is supporting low-budget productions. We've also got Mike Burnhill and Aaron Randawa here, two incredibly knowledgeable product experts uh, from the Canon camp, who's going to talk to us a bit more about the technical side of things and what this means for filmmakers. Um, now before we get going I think it goes without saying that we would love to hear your questions. If you've got any burning questions that come to mind during this session don't be shy, fire them over and we'll hopefully hopefully get those answered. I know these guys would love to answer them. Um, so let's kick off shall we? Simeon, hi. 
Hey, how you doing? I'm really good. How are you? Yeah, very good. Very good. And yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that you're here talking to us this afternoon. So thank you for taking the time out um, to join us. Um, so let's start, let's dive straight in by just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, what you do and briefly what your work has included to date. So many will know um, that I've actually kind of come for a really interesting route. I, I, I kind of worked as a, a wedding filmmaker and photographer um, and, and I really wanted to push um, what technology could do. My, my first camera was a uh, Ah, uh, the Canon XL1 and XL2. Yeah. They were kind of like the shoulder cameras. Um, moment DSLR mm -hmm. technology came along, I jumped straight into using that with weddings and I got a really unique style because I lent into what that technology and innovation could do. You remember DSLR, um, first kind of DSLR from Canon that did video. Yeah. Um, because of the style and standard, what happened is I ended up starting to work with large organizations and corporations. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, I said goodbye to weddings and ended up focusing largely on more of the corporate space. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of where we are now. Um, I'm using uh, storytelling, essentially, to help organizations understand complex subjects. Sometimes that's often is video, um, yeah. and sometimes that's immersive technology like virtual reality. Mm -hmm. So you you essentially earned your stripes doing wedding photography, took all that knowledge and then applied it to a completely new new industry and new uh, new new job, new career essentially. Yeah, I, I think that um, weddings is the most amazing foundation. I don't think there's anything like it. it, it it's like film school on. Um, on another level with all the different things that you've got to try and balance, whether it be you working by yourself, um, trying to work really nimbly with quite a mm -hmm. small crew. Eventually for us, we went from just me to then a second and then third operator, then doing photo and video using the technology. Um, but those individuals that work in the wedding industry, um, they really earn their stripes. And in some ways, um, you know, props to those individuals, in some ways, what they do is often harder than what we sometimes find ourselves needing to do in the corporate arena. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back to talking about your, you know, your passion for storytelling and how, how, how technology complements that. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I've kind of, um, if I evolve and actually the range of cameras um, have, I've evolved with them. Um, yeah. And sometimes they've evolved with me, um, essentially, because, you know, I started off with the this, this smaller uh, DSLRs and then I've looked at the C-series cameras at the cinema line. I'm going, ah, oh, OK, well, they've got more capabilities there. I'm, I'm, I'm a cinema guy, right? I'm a DOP. Yeah. Um, and, and as a result, I then start to lean into those features. And I've, uh, I'm talking to you right now for a C300 Mark II, and I think I've got a C200 just over there. Yeah. Um, and then for some of the shoots, I've literally gone C700, right? Big camera, amazing capabilities. Um, and now we've got some new toys that we get to play with. So really exciting. <laughs> so you're super au fait with Canon's kit, new and old. Yes, yeah. yes, absolutely, definitely. I know you mentioned the previous cameras, you know, the real heavy ones, but let's talk about your tech timeline. You know, you've been in the game for a while. What were some of the other earlier cameras that you used other than the ones you mentioned? Um, I think I've gone through most of the iterations, you know, as I say, 5D Mark II, 5D Mark III. Uh, I was very lucky to be one of the first individuals to work with the 1DC. So if anyone remembers, I've, I'm tempted to run over and get it, but I'm not going to. But the, <laughs> it's the, the DSLR that was like the first in the industry to do 4K video. And that for me was a great jumping point because yeah. to be able to walk to a shoot, do 4K video that I could afford to do um, in a DSLR format um, was was great it was groundbreaking at the time um and i love being able to look at what technology enables me to do mm. um how does it allow me to service my customers differently get a different look um and just keep moving forward and evolving i'm not a fan of standing still and um, mm. i i pride myself and the business prize itself on constantly evolving for many that have watched vivida um myself over the years you'll see that Things just keep moving and keep progressing. So yeah. I need a technology that also does exactly the, you know, exactly the same thing. Yeah, it must be really interesting from your perspective as well to see how the technology is involved. Like you say, the DSLR, the first one to shoot 4K. Oh, mind blowing back in the day compared to now and the capabilities that you're getting out of these new high end newfangled cameras. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that um, there 
sometimes what you end up doing is you look at a camera and you look at some of the capabilities it's got, knowing that it hasn't got necessarily everything you would want. Mm -hmm. But what you're able to do is you're able to push those um, features that are there to the absolute maximum. So, for example, I'm a massive fan of shooting with the with the R5, right? Yeah. Um, being able to shoot, you know, 8K, um, being able to use some of those autofocus features, massively um, exciting. And what I do is I will look at what I'm doing and work out how I can push elements of creativity in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I'll see how I can use um, technology to create a different look. So um, as an example, one of the things that I did um, uh, and back in the day, I'm like, you're making me feel like an, 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 an old man now. Um, yeah, look but, old, it's fine. Thank you very much. I'm hoping <laughs> the, the grey hairs and the beard aren't showing. Um, back in the day, back in the old days, um, what I did when I was doing weddings, I looked at what all the other wedding photographers were using as lenses. And, and back mm -hmm. then it was the 2470, 70 to 200, um, maybe the 1635 as well. It was like the holy trinity, right? Mm -hmm. So as a result, industry had a particular look. But then I looked at the technology and went, right, actually, I'm going to go slightly differently. And I decided to go for a 35 um, 1.4 and an 85 1.2. And that was maybe for photography. And then we were using primes for video, which gave me a very different aesthetic and very yeah. different look. So what I love doing is I love looking at technology, understanding the features, and then going, how can I utilize that to either make a production smoother and easier Mm -hmm. how can it give me a different look and a different aesthetic so yeah. when i was doing dsl using utilizing dslr and those small form factor cameras the ability to use shallow depth of field um even though back in the 5d mark ii days there was no autofocus mm -hmm. gave me a very very different look and the market would look at what we were doing going ah that's different. I don't understand why that's different, but there's a different production level there. Yeah, um, yeah. I would know that behind the scenes, I was just choosing the right technology and I was choosing the right features. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of led the way for what I count as my own personal core values and mm. what Vavida counts as their core, our core values as a team. Um, and clients notice that. Yeah. And I guess in this industry as well, it's, it's you know, it's, it's important to stand out to get people talking about you, to get people noticing, and it sounds like you've got the right formula. Yeah, do you know, I think that what's happening is, um, I'm going more into kind of the, the industry business side of things at the moment, but what we can see is we can see that there's a massive amount of content that is being consumed because everyone's on, you know, devices, mobile phones, um, computer screens, tablets, um, and that's how we're now communicating, right? It, it becomes second nature. So it also becomes very crowded and very, very noisy, right? There is a lot of content. So the key thing is then how can you create content that makes you stand out? Mm. Um, and that's really the, the, the way to look at this. Yeah. Um, standard is important. And um, particularly in the world now, um, whereby, with, look, look what we're doing right now, right? We're, we're, we're talking over, um, you know, we, we're, we're streaming right now. And many of us are using uh, webcams, et cetera. I'm, using eyes in the Canon technology right now, right? To elevate the standard, yeah. um, which really makes a difference when you're starting to think about placing content online. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about what's been happening over the past seven months. It's been, you know, pretty crazy to say the least. What, what has it been like for you and, and your work? How have you been affected or positively affected by this? Uh, it's, oh, okay. So it's been scary. Simple as that. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, I won't lie, it's been scary. Um, so I, I think what the, the initial thing that ends up happening is we see the world changing around us. Um, and all of a sudden we realize that what we can't do is we can't stand still. Um, I realized for my own business that if I didn't take quick action and make quick decisions, actually we um, probably wouldn't survive, right? Yeah. Because I've got team uh, to a certain extent and, 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 um, and clients. And um, it was pretty scary. So we had to very quickly, and I, I know a number of creators watching this will, um, yeah, will be a little bit unsettled by the way things are, um, uh, are moving around. It's really difficult sometimes to read the market, to understand um, what's happening, what are those needs. Yeah. Um, however, what has been exciting is that the, now the use of storytelling has become even more important. And the medium of digital has become even more important. Yeah. What we end up needing to do, and we decided to do, was to 
look at what was going on, look at the landscape and understand how we might need to change our productions and our methodology and our approach in order to be able to thrive mm. in this, this new world um, that, it, you know, that is happening. I think that you can look at this as something that's scary or you can look at this as um, an opportunity to embrace change. Yeah. Um, technology enables you to be able to, to do that. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point you make. You know, times are changing and, you know, for some people they've been forced to evolve. That's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, this is, this is the way things are at the moment. So if you're able to adapt, that's a brilliant thing. And if you've got the technology that enables you to do that as well, to complement that that's you know a winning combination yeah lucy do you know i decided to do at the very beginning is i decided to um essentially say that my aim during this period that you know in essence um forms for many some level of lockdown no matter where you are in 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 the world or or there's changes um with maybe demand and the amount of businesses out there my aim was is i wanted to make sure in some way um i came out personally in a, um, a better version of myself than I was before. Uh, and so yeah. for me, that forms um, the ability to think strategically, look at the options that are out there, understand what things I can change about how I'm doing and the methodology. Mm-hmm. Also, um, I'm playing with equipment, right? I'm learning, I'm training. I'm, 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 I'm like the athlete, right? Um, that yeah. is constantly in warm up mode, um, ready to go. What you cannot do in this time is stand totally still and allow the body to Mm -hmm. seize up. You have to keep yourself mobilized. So I'm training myself. I'm playing with equipment. I'm testing. I'm I'm experimenting. I'm talking to potential customers and clients about what Mm -hmm. their needs are. I'm listening and I'm shaping my own business as an individual and as a team to be able to um, adapt and thrive. Yeah. So what are some of the biggest changes you've noticed in terms of client briefs and what, what, you bring to a shoot or what is expected um so i think one of the things that is happening is that um, many organizations end up looking to do more but with less right and it tends to be that their budgets in reality are shrinking just because they are don't they're having to spread that um money over um you know, a longer period of time, or they need to hold on to what they've got to protect themselves. But what they are doing is they're still acting. They still need content. So when I look at things like a reduced budget, then I start to think, okay, how do I still be in a position to deliver for clients, but with a reduced budget? Sometimes for me, that means that I may utilize less crew on a particular job, Mm -hmm. which means I might build a team for me as an individual going out as a filmmaker and telling stories or with lower numbers. And that also keeps that cost down. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I think that happens is Mm -hmm. that clients in some ways are are starting to need to do more. Why? Because the pace of which people are consuming digital content, Mm -hmm. um, Instagram, LinkedIn, right. Um, for, for businesses, a lot of content going out on LinkedIn, other social channels, the, the content needs to be more like a conversation. The way yeah. Vida used to do things, and I used to do things, I used to be steering into creating the larger pieces, like the larger brand pieces, right? Yeah. Um, whereby a company might go, hey, this is going to last us for, a, for a six months or for a year. What now happens is, is that organizations may be trying to get 10 pieces of content, mm-hmm. um, 20 pieces of content. Why? Because it makes sense. Yeah, what brands need to... Chunks. Exactly. You've yeah. got it. Because it needs to be a conversation. So mm-hmm. it tends to be, I believe, that what organizations now need to do is make lots of content regularly, yeah. um, which means that in some ways the same budgets are available. It's just that the behavior and the type of productions change. Yeah. And I feel that that's actually really positive because yeah. I think that's actually the, the right thing um, for, you know, in some ways for filmmaking. Yeah, yeah. So we're talking about, you know, lower budgets and constraints, but does lower budget mean lower quality? Well, it can't, um, I, I, I think. I mean, I think because, so as a creative, I've got my own standards of what mm-hmm. I expect. Yeah, of course. Um, the organisations themselves have got an expectation of, of standard. And what we've said earlier is we know that the content needs to stand out. So mm-hmm. when we're working with technology, um, you know, the C70s, you know, is a prime example of that. 
I want to be able to deliver a really great quality outfit, even if it is me working by myself or mm-hmm. one other person. And it, so, for example, um, I'm just thinking back to a past project. I, I did a project with Burberry um, where the fashion brand, we were doing a, um, a film project uh, throughout Leeds and other parts of the country. And I, and I was using a larger crew yeah. um, for one of those productions, larger camera. Um, I had a, um, a focus puller, uh, essentially, um, keeping the focus. I had somebody else on, a, you know, on another gimbal. So we had a, we had a team. Yeah. That team wasn't massive, but it was still moderate in size. Yeah, yeah. The next time a shoot came up, they said to me, um, oh, we still want to work with you because we love the way you think. We love the way you see the story. Yeah. Um, but for this, the budget is much smaller. Can you still work with us? What I need to be able to do is I need to be able to say yes. And I said yes. Yes. For that project, what I was doing was I was taking one camera, one body, uh, uh, and uh, actually I shot with one lens, right? Um, and, and, I, and I produced the content for them, and mm-hmm. up it went. The key thing is that for me personally, and I know for many watching this, the aim is, is to always be in a position to say, yes, um, yeah. I can do something. You yeah. just need to scale um, your production to fit. But what I need to be able to do is I need to be able to say yes to a client because I know from experience where sometimes you end up saying no mm-hmm. is the time that they go and find another service provider and form a new relationship and you cannot get back in again. Yeah. So I want to hold that client. Even if they say yes, um, smaller project, I need to be able to say yes, particularly because not only is it the, the budget side that people are thinking about, mm-hmm. um, we are having to... Um, film potentially with, with with social distance in mind right we, we're shooting with creating with social distance in mind so that might mean that we now need to have and um, you know less crew from that perspective yeah. um, or we may be turning up into someone's personal space um, and filming yeah. in their personal space um, yeah. so those are things that we now start to consider but they are really exciting opportunities as we start to evolve the way we we do filmmaking yeah yeah so it's it's really important then to just have a bit of kit that can produce quality content for so not just a solo shooter but it's important for solo shooting to be able to thrive yeah so yeah. with lower, lower budget productions in mind is the c70 a good fit for run and gun filmmakers and how did you find working with it in short the answer is yes right <laughs> um, <laughs> The so what are the things that I end up looking for? Um, so image quality, hundred percent. Um, yeah. Other thing for me is sound, professional sound. I, I want to have a a microphone. I'm doing um, voice interviews. Tend to be a, a key element. So the C70 having professional sound in there is is really key with the um, XLR and mini XLR um, inputs. So yeah. that becomes really important. And then um. I use cinema cameras for a reason, right? Because cinema cameras have got features that are designed for professionals. It's just that now what I'm looking for um, is maybe it's a camera that I can afford. Mm -hmm. And because the camera is smaller and and more affordable, that gives me a new opportunity to get a first camera for cinema, maybe for some, a second camera for the others, or actually be able to afford to have multiple cameras because you want to be able to put you know do a two camera shoot for example yeah yeah um so i i think that becomes really important um there and and really exciting and then if i look at the features that the camera have got uh the c70 has got features that on the shoots that i've played where i've played and tinkered um, and the shoot that i did i was Mm. really able to embrace to change the methodology if you like um you know as i actually approach that production and shoot which was really exciting yeah so this camera completely changed the way you work yes um you know the things that really stood out to me was so stabilization Mm -hmm. i I love it right (laughs) so for, for some of them may have seen some of my social media posts know that i often arrive on a shoot with a easy rig, like the whole vest suit with the arm that goes over the top and then it's holding the camera, right? Uh, I like it because it looks really cool as well. Um, it however, cool, it? <laughs> it looks really cool <laughs> in tight spaces on smaller shoots Not where you so don't much. have that assistance. Mm-hmm. Right? Um, what you end up wanting to do is I want to be able to have, because I'm, I'm wearing that. Why am I wearing it? 
because I want the handheld look. Mm. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to have to have the whole weight of the camera and the setup and hold that for a day. But what I did with the C70 was I was able to get the same look handheld, stabilized with a little bit of the movement where I wanted it from my own body, mm. but just without anything. I didn't need the monopod. Uh, I didn't need the, the tripod, tripod for an interview. Yeah. Okay. Um, all uh, the, the likes of an easy rig. So that stabilization for me was totally game changing. Yeah, um, because I could literally go out to a you know a, a shoot with minimal footprint and know that I'm in a position to get it, but understanding that the features in the camera are truly cinema features. Yeah, I think the, the stabilization is a really important feature to hammer home. You know, a lot of people are used to slapping a camera on a tripod, like you say, or using external accessories in order to get that that solid, stabilized shot. So the fact that you're holding a lightweight camera, you're able to get a super stabilized video to the point where some people might not even believe that you were hand holding the camera because it's that good. So I can, I can see why this has completely blown your mind. So what other features of the C70 um, do you particularly like that were beneficial to this shoot? Um, so I am one that loves ND filters because yeah. for those of, you know, for many that if you've been shooting with um, DSLRs, um, other mirrorless cameras, one of the things that tends to happen, if you go out into, into uh, bright sunlight, for example, in order to balance the exposure, what you end up doing is changing the f-stop. So as you increase the f-stop, the, the depth of field um, then expands to an extent where there's not the visual aesthetic that I love, which is where you have the subject in focus and mm -hmm. the background blurry. Like people love that. <laughs> so when you go outdoors with a camera that doesn't have ND filters, what happens is, is you have to change the settings so everything's in focus. Yeah, so for yeah. me, that's not necessarily the style that, that I like. So you end up having two options, two options. One is to add ND filters on front of the camera, which can be done, but it's another bag to carry and things yeah. to change, particularly as you start to change lenses. Yes. But what I love is having the NDs on the inside of the body. So I can go from outdoor, from indoors to outdoors, press yeah. a button on the side, and all of a sudden you get these virtual sunglasses that allow me to open up the lens to get a beautiful blurry background when I'm shooting mm -hmm. outdoors. So I love those internal NDs. Um, the audio, absolutely. Um, for those that have maybe been used to shooting on um, a non-cinema camera, being able to plug in a, a lav mic, um, you know, other microphone sources yeah. becomes really, is, is the difference because you know that sound um, on the timeline is the other half of that editing timeline. Um, yeah. It's equally as important as the visual. So the camera being able to support that professional level of audio um, is, is absolutely um, critical. Yeah. Um, the ability to shoot in C-Log2 is a brilliant, get, you know, like this is the, for many will be totally game changing. Like for yeah. some, they would have been used to C-Log uh, uh, whereby when you film in the camera, you can, you can get the image quality looking slightly flatter, um, you know, as you're recording so that when you bring it into editing, you've got the ability to bring back that contrast and saturation. Yeah. But when you shoot on C-Log 2, the image is so flat to the eye that means that in post-production you get to bring that back and you get so many more options to be able to manipulate it yeah for me personally if i'm totally honest with you i found c-log 2 in the past quite difficult to work with mm. um it was you know you're you're editing with it in post-production and you need to make sure that you don't bring out too much um noise in the image it's like um, working in Ferrari mode and those that are brilliant DOPs um, are, are able to shoot quickly in that mode partly because they've got other teams around them that are helping them but because of the DGO sensor the lack of noise on there means that when I shoot with something like C-Log2 all of a sudden it becomes in, as I call it much more accessible than before that even if I'm running quick and nimble and then editing things quickly on the fly afterwards it becomes much easier for me to start to play with that with that footage yeah. so that is brilliant um and then to know that you can shoot to two cards right yeah. um often what ends up happening is you end up sometimes I mean it's recommended that you have a backup camera of some form right people who are yes. shooting out there that's always recommended um, 
What I used to do, Lucy, is always make sure I had a second camera operator as well, because, you know, if you're shooting on a camera that's got one card, you're almost hedging your bets and going, if the worst happened, somebody else is filming it. But when you go to a C-line camera that's got the two memory card slots, you know that the camera was recording two times. So then you've got that extra element of resilience and safety that becomes important when you're shooting on a small scale in production as well. It allows you to feel more comfortable, more relaxed when you're shooting, even though the reality is I would have another smaller DSLR, another camera with me as well, um, just in case, because yeah, yeah. I, I, I have dropped a camera or a lens before, right? So I want to make sure. That, that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so with all of that, with all that in mind, would you say this is an ideal product for a low budget film? Yes. So I think this is an ideal project for product for um, a low budget film. Uh, sorry, I don't mean to wag the pen at you. Uh, a low budget <laughs> film um, whereby somebody as an indie filmmaker is trying to do something that's maybe drama related. Um, trying to create you know, a piece with such beautiful, precise um, director of photography aesthetic. Mm -hmm. This is a cinema camera with all of the features you'd expect of a cinema camera. It's just in a smaller form factor. Um, the other audience is, is that if you're working perhaps in more of a corporate industry mm -hmm. um, on the commercial side, the ability to have a professional video camera in that small package and form factor becomes really key. The other audience is is actually more the direct um, the documentary filmmaking, right? Because typically direct um, documentary filmmaking, you need to be nimble, right? We we, we um, is it guerrilla style, where you essentially you end up just having your camera on you and you literally need to arrive at a location, adapt on the fly, be really yeah. quick. Right. You tend to choose a small camera so you're quick and nimble. Um, something that you can control easily, whereas, you know, the bigger cameras that are normally, you know, cinema quality that are slightly larger, they don't necessarily lend themselves to that. But with this, what you get is the ability even to do a documentary, have mm -hmm. cinema aesthetic, but in a form factor that is quick, nimble, where all the buttons are there. And actually, you can program all the shortcuts to make sure that that camera is literally designed and molded for you. Yes, this, this thing is just so multifaceted and just will appeal to just so many different people. I've got another question for you. Um, how is the touch screen? You know, is it reliable, especially because there's no, there's no viewfinder? Yeah, so, um, do you know, if I'm honest, this is a feature that I kind of take for granted because I also use the Canon still cameras. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to going in on the other still cameras and I'm, I've got really used to that touch screen. Mm -hmm. uh, where I've jumped onto a video camera and I go, hup, hup. <laughs> uh, uh, so it, actually the moment I, I got that, got the C70, I actually didn't think about it. If I'm honest with you, I just yeah. touched the screen and it worked. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, I do appreciate that for those that are, don't necessarily use the photographic cameras, that is like, what do you mean I can touch the screen and, and, <laughs> and going to those settings? Yeah. So I think for many, that is a really exciting feature. Mm -hmm. Um, you, for me, it just feels right um, yeah. because it's a feature that I've used on other Canon cameras. Yeah, you know what I love one thing I'm getting from you, the enthusiasm for this camera and I love how it's completely changed or forced, not forced you, but, you know, encouraged you to change the way you work and ch change the way you think and evolve with the new technology. And the fact that you're saying, you know, this is an ideal camera for a one man band, I think speaks volumes for the capabilities of what this, what this camera can do. So thanks, Simeon. We've been nattering for quite a while. So I'm going uh, <laughs> to, I'm going to bring Aaron and Mike into the conversation now. Hey guys. Hey Lucy. How's it going? Hi Lucy. I'm good. How are you? Nice to see you. All good. Day two of the big event. Day two. Yeah, this is number two for you. But getting a bit greedy, aren't you, Aaron? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, Aaron, I've got a first, uh, the first question I'm going to fire at you. So we've obviously been talking a lot about the C70. It launched yesterday. You know, we had a chat with Gelade Olesanya and Elisa Lanico, who have been using the camera in the run-up to the launch. So why is it so important for Canon to create a product like this? So this product is a completely new concept. It doesn't replace any existing ones. And the reason we made it is because we're seeing more and more filmmakers use mirrorless cameras and DSLR cameras. Mm -hmm. But we're also aware that those cameras have their limitations. So we wanted to go back to the drawing board, make a camera that has all the professional features required 
ND filters, XLRs, time code, 16 stops of dynamic range, but cram all of that into a compact, lightweight body that's uh, designed for solo shooters, ergonomically designed for solo shooters, just like the mirrorless and DSLRs. And um, with that idea of having a small, mighty, powerful camera, we think a lot of filmmakers out there are going to get really excited about, about it. Yeah, I think so. Just based on the, the general theme of all the sessions we've been doing today and yesterday, people are just so mind blown by all this, you know, cinema camera being crammed into such a small body. It's super impressive. Yeah. 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 So my, and, uh, oh, God, sorry. Sorry. sorry, I was going to add one other thing. <laughs> I, I like to uh, actually look at this camera to say that it has three essential features and three exclusive features. So the essential ones are the fact that it can record for an unlimited duration. It's a dedicated cinema camera yeah. and it's got uh, ND filters. So you don't have to, just as Simeon said, you don't have to have a bag full of filters to put, put on. You can shoot in any type of environment. And then you've got the XLRs. So you don't have to record audio uh, externally and you're not limited to the type of professional microphones you can have. Yeah. So there are three essential fe uh, features for filmmakers, Absolutely. but then, the exclusive ones that make this even more unique, despite it being in such a compact body, is that it has our dual pixel autofocus, which is giving people really reliable, accurate results. Mm -hmm. It's got that Canon color science with the skin tones. They look natural, they look organic, and uh, we're really renowned for that. And finally, it's got the DGO sensor. So that's 16 stops of dynamic range. Sa same thing we've seen with C300 Mark III. And uh, you're getting that at, in an entry level cinema EOS camera, which, yeah. which is amazing. Yeah, so. it's just such an incredible bit of kit. And you're only really scratching the surface on the features with, with what you just said. You know, there's so much more. Um, so you just mentioned autofocus. So, Mike, um, autofocus, cap autofocus capabilities, um, you know, as we know, really help out smaller crews. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the autofocus feature on this camera? Um, and no, sorry, tell us about the autofocus features this camera supports and the technology it shares with the R5 and R6. Yeah, well, thanks, Lucy. Um, I thought Aaron was going to steal my thunder, but yeah, the <laughs> autofocusing in these, uh, this camera is, again, it's where the still side and the video side of Canon work together with this dual pixel AF. And with the 1DX Mark III, we developed a new system where a deep learning, um, or as, a, as you correctly saw in Grammarly, point out it's actually deep learned where we use an AI system basically to analyze thousands and millions of images and to be able to detect what a person looks like and where they are in the frame so it knows what the person is whichever direction they are and this allows the camera to track and pick up people much better than ever before and we introduced that sort of for sports really in the 1dx mark three mm -hmm. and then we took it to another level in the r5 and r6 by introducing wildlife and then the crazy thing is we then decided to add this to a entry level video camera and i know autofocusing has been one of those sort of a technologies in video which has been a dirty word you know why would you do autofocus it here yeah uh, but yeah, you know, for the single user, basically, you know, they can't afford a focus puller. Focusing is super critical. You know, mm -hmm. there's no point shooting amazing 4K video footage if it's out of focus. That's just, you know, goes in the bin. Yeah. So, focusing is super, super important. I'm sure, you know, we talked to um, Simeon and how much footage he's shot. That's amazing. But then it had to be trashed because it's just not shot. So, mm, having that doesn't. A... No, 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 no. That I don't do out of focus footage. <laughs> don't do out of focus for sure. no, not, not sure. anymore in the old <laughs> days <laughs> yeah. okay the old days yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the old days you used to have uh, yeah we did 85 1.2s yeah, these lenses were super critical in the focusing you know if you were out by a few millimeters it could really affect the image and this is where this eye tracking and face tracking really kind of allows people like Simi to shoot i think we saw it in the beginning of the video where he's using the r5 boot you know at macro on the pen nib and it's tracking mm -hmm. the pen nib as it goes across the page and it's such a shallow depth of field imagine trying to do that manually focus how many takes would it take and literally one take and it's done and that's where there's amazing af in a single user operating sort of camera this is mind-blowing really kind of saves you so much time and retakes 
I think that's one of the most important things to take away from that time saving, you know, especially on you know budget, low budget shoots or when you're a one man band, you need things to just work as you want them to. You don't want to be kind of faffing about with things. And what I'm getting from this is the intelligence in this autofocus system is just unbelievable. And like you say, mind blowing. Gonna yeah, it's, you know, it's all down to AI, it's programming the system and putting this algorithm into these cameras and therefore mm -hmm. it can it knows exactly what to focus on and tracks that for you. And it's just one step less that you have to worry about. I think as Simon talked about before, like wedding photographers and all this stuff, there's so much going on in the scene. You're worrying about, you know, the composition, exposure, all this stuff. And now it's one less thing to worry about. Don't have to yeah. worry about the focusing. I can concentrate on the main aspects of the film, the most important moments, you know. That yeah. came out for me, uh, Mike. You kind of remind me, I was, I was filming Bryony, um, the artist, and she had her face to me, right? And of course, the face detection is, you know, um, locked on automatically. And then normally I would be thinking, I need to be prepared to disengage the autofocus as the head turns around and she starts to face a different direction, right? Uh, but because of the intelligent tracking, she turned around, right? Backwards to me, walking mm. away. And it still managed to keep locked on her. I had yeah. my finger ready to disengage the autofocus, but it still tracked and understood somehow that it was the same person just turned around, even though normally you'd be going, okay, eyes, mouth, <laughs> turned around, eyes, mouth, gone. Camera panic, no, yeah. it's still locked on. And there you probably got a lovely shot that you could put into the video that you weren't expecting, kind of, you know, it's like, if a normal camera that was ah oh, missed that can you do that again you mm. miss that sometimes that magic emotion and i think one there's one extra little feature we've included in this product um for the face tracking is again their face tracking is wonderful um we've added a face only priority mode for this camera because in video if someone enter, exits the frame what does the camera do normally a stills camera it would change and maybe focus on the background and that's not always what you want in a video you maybe want to keep the focus in the same place so it gives a more natural feel especially if the person leaves the frame is going to come back in again so the focusing will stop as when the person leaves the frame and won't refocus so it gives you a much more naturalistic kind of professional filmic kind of look and this is what the camera's been doing clever is thinking like a you know like a focus puller for you yeah just like you say, make it one less thing to kind of tick off the list so you can focus primarily on more important things like telling the story. Yeah, and as you know, you can get extra shots that normally you might not have, you would have missed. It's extra mm. beautiful footage that kind of helps create the story. And Aaron, what happens if you use the new mount adapter, which was released yesterday, um, with the C70 in terms of autofocus? Uh, so the mount adapter allows e well, our extensive range of EF lenses to be used with the camera. But uh, in terms of autofocus, it still works. The metadata of the lens is it's just as if you were using uh, an EF mount camera. And that's the really nice thing about having um, uh, Canon lenses, a Canon adapter, uh, Canon uh, body. It means everything's compatible with each other. Yeah. And um, Simon, I'm oh, sorry, Simon, can also, you tell us the, the difference and benefits of having a cinema camera that can support RF lenses? Um, what, what kind of effect will that have on you and the productions you work on? So the quality of the RF lenses is naturally because of the, you know, the new technology is on a different, is on a different level. Um, I noticed the difference in the speed of the, of the mount. Um, from memory, um, and Mike will have to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong and Aaron, the, the, the EF was something like, like eight contact points and then the RF was like 12 contact points, which that essentially is like more bandwidth, right? More processing data that can go through, which mm -hmm. meant that my autofocus was way better, much quicker. And then also things like the stabilize, um, you know, stabilization with the, with the right lenses was, was mm -hmm. really different as well. I like using the RF as well, not just because of the quality, but because of the, the extra programmable ring that you get on the front of the lens. Um, I enjoy using cinema lenses. And one of the things you get on the cinema lenses, you get the, the aperture ring that smoothly turns so that you can change the aperture directly on the lens. So what I do is I take an RF lens, I, I program in the camera to um, have the RF's ring at the front, turn that, change that into aperture. Yeah. And then my workflow feels more like I'm working with a Cine Prime, a mm. Canon Cine Prime. So I, um, yeah, I, I really enjoy that. I think it's also really exciting as I'm looking at the range of lenses that are coming out. 
Canon are kind of looking at this new mount, this new technology, looking at the the new lenses and kind of working out, right, what more, what other options this is, does this allow us to do? Yeah. Which means I'm seeing lenses come out that haven't been possible before because of the new mount. So I'm excited by what's there now, mm -hmm. but I'm also excited about the kind of the possibilities for the future. And because this is a cinema camera has got that RF in it, it means that um, the future proofing of that camera becomes really critical. So um, I'm more budget conscious now, right? And when I'm thinking about spending money on a piece of technology, I'm thinking, um, how future proof is this? Because this is a um, cinema camera that has the all those cinema features, but it's also got the most up-to-date um, RF mount that yeah. is for the future. I know that I can have a camera there that is good for me for um, a long time. Yeah. And Aaron, can more lenses be used with the new um, mount adapter? They're only three lenses. So what happens, for example, if you use a EF 50 millimeter F1.4, for example? Sure. So that's actually a really good question. Officially, only three lenses are fully supported on the new 0 0.71 times mount adapter on launch. Mm -hmm. And those are the 24 to 105, 24 to 70 and 15 to 35. Um, uh, 16 to 35, sorry. And those um, lenses, they ha give full support for chromatic aberration correction and for lens metadata. Um, however, you can use any EF lens with the adapter. You'll get the full frame angle of view and the additional stop of light. Uh, however, it may not have the chromatic aberration correction or mm -hmm. the correct metadata at launch. However, we'll be regularly updating the firmware of the product so yeah. that uh, more and more lenses are uh, supported in the future. That's good to know. You heard that here first. <laughs> Mike, I've got a question for you now. What are the EOS R benefits that this C70 boasts and why is it useful to have them in Canon Cinema EOS lineup? Well, for the RF mount, I mean, the, the benefits of the RF mount is just going back to what Simeon said about the 12 contacts. In fact, we don't actually use all 12 contacts. Some of those contacts are there for the future. You know, the EF mount was invented in 1987. And we're still using it today. It's adapted for yeah. so long. And the RF mount is designed with a future looking vision as well, because we didn't expect a lens that mount to last that long. So this time we're planning ahead so we've added extra capabilities and there's extra capacity in there for the future so it's not just the speed is actually just a change of protocol so and also the rf mount is what i call bilingual um so it can actually talk rf language which is much faster and when you put an ef lens on by the adapters it actually speaks ef language so there's no translation yeah. there's no adaption if you buy normal other adapters there's a little chip that translates and with the RF adapters, there are no translation. You know, with any translation, it takes one small thing to say, you know, rather than saying this food is wonderful to I've insulted your mother. You know, there's little things in translation can cause major issues. And this yeah. is why cameras can kind of lock up for no apparent reason, because one bit of data is in the wrong place. But because these cameras can speak RF and EF, both series of lenses will fit and work seamlessly together. Yeah. But it's also the vision of having these two of, of the RF mount is now looking at video. EF was never designed for video. It wasn't really designed for digital, to be honest. You know, digital was a thing for, for so far in the future. But we mm. know video is super important. So that's part of the design of the RF mount. So we have things like the um, aperture can be moved in smaller increments than ever before. So we can move in eight to the stop. So now when you're changing apertures, you don't get sudden jumps in exposure it's most normal still lenses move in a third of a stop so when you move you get a big jump in brightness now we can move in much smaller increments yeah. then the is which we kind of hinted at yeah again that is not only possible because of the high speed communication between the lens and the body the lens and the body can talk so fast that they can compensate and work together as a team and that's yeah. why um Simeon's been able to get that amazing IS performance. Mm. There are many thing, other things like focus breathing correction. Again, having this high-speed communication means the motors and the lens can compensate. If you look at a proper cine lens, it's so big because mechanically you have these driven gears to move these floating elements around to correct for focusing breathing. And what we've done now is made that electronic. We're passing that data super fast. So as you're focusing, the actual inside, the lens is doing all kinds of crazy things just to kind of compensate for focusing breathing. And it's all happening in real time. And that's thanks to the RF mount and the communication. So therefore mm -hmm. we can make, you know, 2084 to 70 
with autofocusing and focus breathing correction in such a small package, you know, including mm -hmm. image stabilization, while a cinema version would be much, much larger, and much more expensive to make. Yeah, yeah. There's so many things to love about this. Um, so Aaron, we're, I'm a very conscious of time, I'm going to fire a question at you now. Um, Simeon mentioned he likes the range of codecs that the camera can support. So can you tell us why specific ones have been chosen um, and why not more? Sure. So you can shoot in XFAVC on this camera. It's Canon's very reliable, robust format. We've been using it for many years and um, it's supported in so many NLEs and workflows. Um, and that uh, format can record up to 410 megabits a second. Um, now that gives you a beautiful balance between uh, great image quality with 16 stops of dynamic range and reasonable file size. So I'm sure Simeon will, will vouch for me here as a professional who's working on so many different types of productions. XFAVC has a really fast turnaround. It gives you all of that latitude to manipulate in post, whereas RAW, you're having to make a lot of decisions. Invest, uh, invest more budget into camera mm -hmm. capacity editing capacity, invest more time in noise reduction, in sharpening the image. Um, so it, that's more considered for higher budget productions, whereas this is a entry level cinema EOS and we believe XFAVC is more than sufficient. What, what are your thoughts on that, Simeon? Yeah, I totally agree. So um, if I'm totally honest with you, I've used raw capability on the cameras that I've got only a few times in production because for me, speed of being able to shoot what I need to um, in camera and have it look great, first key objective. The mm -hmm. next thing for me is to be able to get that footage onto an editing timeline and either I need to be able to move that speed and get that content out. Even for the Burberry production, I had a master of, I had to get it ready over the weekend, full production from shoot. And then we had to have it edited and out the door for the Monday morning, having got the footage captured on the Friday, right? Um, that means speed. So I'm looking for a look that I can drop onto the timeline, grade and manipulate quickly, or a bit like now, I want it to look amazing instantly um, because of the setting. Um, so I'm looking for flexibility, but speed for me is the key thing when I'm considering the budget. Because even if I'm passing footage over to an editor, um, externally, um, an editor costs me money per hour per day. Um, so yeah, that's why you know some of these formats that uh, Aaron is talking about, um, having something that's really easy to work with is is, is really key. Yeah, yeah. And Aaron, how does the C70 and um, you know benefit grading and color correction you know, in terms of codec and codec sorry and functionality? So you can shoot in uh, Canon Log3, which is um, giving you 14 stops of dynamic range, and it. People have been using that since the C300 Mark II uh, launched. It's been around for about five years, and it's been everybody, everyone's kind of go-to uh, log curve. Yeah, you can just apply the Canon lookup table if you wish or grade manually, but it's quite easy to work with, and it gives you really nice color and color reproduction and skin tones. Mm -hmm. uh, however, just as Simeon mentioned earlier, Canon Log2 in the past, uh, some people have felt that you need to be a professional grader to to utilize it to get that full range but also get a very uh, professional image very quickly uh, however now that we've incorporated the dgo sensor which is um, really giving you a clean output and and um, getting details in those shadows, but also not amplifying uh, the noise because the mm -hmm. signal to noise ratio on this camera is so much better with the DGO. So now Canon Log 2 with its 16 stops of dynamic range is becoming accessible to everyone. And yeah. they're able to get a quick turnaround on it and get image uh, results that are absolutely amazing for an mm -hmm. entry level camera. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, an, it's amazing to be a filmmaker right now. Actually, when, when I was um, uh, 17, I bought a 5D Mark II. I was one of the, and I, I got that for the video and I was amazed by the full frame. And mm. I haven't been so amazed since then until DGO has come out. Yeah. And now that entry level market has something to be really excited about. Yeah, and I think you make a really valid point there, accessible to everyone, not ostracizing anyone, they're not picking a niche group of people. And that's really important, I think, especially for a new product. Um, Mike, before we um, sign off, I've got a quick question for you. Um, the EOS R5 um, can record in Canon Log only. Are there any plans for Canon Log 2 or 3? Uh, yeah, we've already kind of 
pre-announced that we are going to work on Canon Log 3 and bring that to the camera in the future, mm -hmm. along with we going to add a full HD 120 frames per second mode and also more compression options for the RAW and the other modes as well. The All Eye and IPB will have greater compression. But yeah, Canon Log 3 is one of the first feedback we received from some of the users because they, they loved it so much. Yeah. Um, although we've had Canon Log 1 on the SLRs for a while, people always preferred the Canon Log 3. It was just easy to grade and better dynamic range. As Aaron said, it was just the, the go-to log for most of our Canon users. So people saw the great video functionality of the R5 went, yeah, but we want the Canon Log 3 from that. And as Aaron said, yeah, the Canon Log 2 is always been one of those um, not niche sort of logs, not not always the most popular, but Canon Log 3 is the, the one that will most benefit most users for us. Yeah, yeah. And on that note, right on the nose at two o'clock, that brings us to the end of our Q&A live session. Thanks, guys. Um, and thanks you to the audience for submitting some really brilliant questions. Um, as, like, as I've said in the other sessions, apologies if you didn't get your question read out. You know, there's only so much time that we had and so much to talk about. So um, my apologies if you didn't get your question heard. Um, I'd like to thank Simeon, Mike and Aaron. Simeon, firstly, thank you for sharing your amazing experiences and your career timeline. You've done so much. You really are quite inspiring. And Aaron and Mike, as always, the fountain of information and numbers and alphanumeric codes. It's brilliant. You guys know so much. So thank you for sharing your insights into the new kit. I hope the guys watching at home have got some valuable insight to take home after deep diving into the new technology. Um, now, just before we sign off, um, I'd like to invite you to join us at 4 p.m. CEST time or 3 p.m. UK time, where we'll have Daniel Ehiman sharing his experience of using cameras from the Canon Cinema EOS range of storytelling tools in the Nollywood film industry. We've also had four other live stream interviews that have taken place over the past two days, which can now be viewed on the Canon Europe YouTube page. So make sure you go and check that out. We've covered some brilliant topics, including a first behind the scenes look at the new Canon EOS C70 and how full frames influence cinematography. Um, it's also worth noting there is a special episode of the Canon Shutter Stories podcast. These guys are all on it. There's some other guys that have been on the sessions over the past couple of days. It really is a fantastic listen so I highly urge you to go and have a listen of that um, and please do join us in an hour for the next session.